New details tonight about a 14-hour standoff right here in Bryan College Station. We have the latest from police. Plus, we go inside Texas A&M to see how the virus is affecting the International Student Office. And with a heat wave coming, will the Texas power grid be able to withstand the extra usage? Your Care HD News starts right now. Connecting the Brazos Valley, this is KRHD News. Thanks for joining us at 10. I'm Hallie Jones. Nobody is injured this evening after a single driver vehicle hit a DPS trooper's vehicle. DPS officials say a trooper was working another crash at Jones Creek where a concrete truck drove off the road. It is unclear if the driver of the vehicle will be issued a citation. The southbound lanes of Highway 6 have since reopened. And new information tonight about a 14-hour long standoff in College Station last night. College Station police say a man threatened to kill himself and someone else just before noon yesterday. Once on scene, officers learned the man was alone inside of the home on Whispering Creek Drive. The man surrendered to officers around 2 a.m. this morning. No one was injured during the situation. The investigation is ongoing tonight and charges are pending. If you try to renew your passport lately, you've probably noticed the process takes a lot longer due to the pandemic. Problems like this pose a particular issue for Texas A&M international student population. KRHD reporter Rebecca Fiedler brings us more. I was really worried last year when I planned to go to Bangladesh because uh, all of a sudden my younger sister passed away, so I needed to go back. Whether it's booking a flight or renewing a passport or student visa, Texas A&M's international students like Kamrul Hassan of Bangladesh have struggled both to leave the country and to stay in it. The Texas A&M International Student Services Office has been working hard to help their students obtain visas and to renew passports in a time where delays last as long as three months. Many of the U.S. embassies are still operating under emergency protocol because of COVID-19. So the number of visas being issued is, um, for the past few months has been much lower than it has been in the past. Texas A&M typically hosts as many as 6,000 international students. Now, a number of those students may not be able to attend classes in Aggieland. Students who are stateside at the moment can also face numerous issues, such as the inability to obtain a Texas driver's license. As long as they're working with us on getting their paperwork renewed or they're in the process of keeping the U.S. government informed, they're, they, uh, the government works with them as much as they can. New tonight, the Texas Education Agency is allowing parents the option to hold back their child because of the education disruption from COVID-19 for kindergarten or pre-K kids. The agency says if a student did not attend kindergarten or pre-K but are of age, missed quote many days of school because of the virus or struggled. For first to eighth grade, the agency says if your child struggled most of the year and you might want to hold back your student in high school if they struggled in a required course. If you want to hold your child back, you must tell the school district in writing before you, the start of the school year. If the district doesn't agree with your decision, the district will have a committee meet with you about the decision. After the meeting, you will make the final decision and the district must honor that choice. And good info for every parent, ask the school for additional support and resources for your child. Former U.S. Representative Beto O'Rourke is donating $600,000 to Texas House Democrats who are currently in Washington, D.C. during the special session. The money is good for lodging, food, and transportation for all 50 state House members and some of their staff members. It, it will also help with a virtual voting rights conference, according to a state House member. The funds are coming from a works powered by the People Group. A converted Texas prison will house illegal immigrants accused of state crimes. It is part of a new border policy by Governor Greg Abbott. State and local law enforcement can't charge anyone with crossing the border illegally, but Abbott is allowing officers to charge them with trespassing and criminal mischief. Those arrested would be sent to the Briscoe unit in Dilly. Abbott moved all prisoners there to another facility last month. China says it will not accept the World Health Organization's plan to continue studying the origins of COVID-19. 
The vice minister of the National Health Commission says that he was taken aback by the plan for a second study. He dismissed the theory that the virus leaked from a Chinese lab, calling it a rumor that counters common sense and science. Research from the Ad Council says one in three American adults are not yet vaccinated against COVID-19. 20% say they want to learn more about it first, and now the group is trying to help with that. So that's why the Ad Council and the COVID Collaborative are trying to, again, educate those. What are the facts? And it's very important to educate ourselves as to the current state of the pandemic, as well as what are the effective means of combating that pandemic. This is especially important as misinformation on the vaccine continues to circulate and the Delta variant continues to spread. It now accounts for 83% of all cases in the United States. Health officials have also been reporting more cases of the Lambda variant. Hospital in Houston saw its first case this week. Meanwhile, a Florida hospital is now turning elective surgeries away again because there has been such an increase in unvaccinated COVID patients. A large proportion of the population is unvaccinated and we have a highly contagious variant. When those two are brought together, obviously that leads to a uh, worsening point, a surge, for example, in cases in particular in otherwise young and healthy individuals currently. The Ad Council and Collab uh, COVID Collaborative are offering resources. They can be found at getvaccineanswers.org. Those include vaccine information for yourself or a child. The site will also give you safety facts, what to expect after getting vaccinated, and the differences between vaccines. Recent study from the Commonwealth Fund estimates the COVID vaccine has saved nearly 280,000 American lives and prevented more than a million hospitalizations. Car prices have been making up a big portion of overall inflation rates. Next on our lineup, how some car makers say that consumers could start seeing relief. The National Weather Service is updating its alert system. After the break, we hear from meteorologist Caleb Chevalier about the possibility or lack thereof of the Brazos Valley needing the new system anytime soon. The National Weather Service has a new way to warn you that a dangerous storm is in your area. The NWS is adding a damage threat alert to its severe thunderstorm warnings. The damage threat will come in three categories, destructive, considerable, and base. Base stands for baseline, which is the lowest of threat levels. Destructive is the most dangerous threat, and it means baseball-sized hail and 80 mile an hour winds may be present. It'll start on the 28th. You can also download our Storm Shield app. Would you need that alert anytime soon? Let's get the latest from First Alert Meteorologist Caleb Chevalier. Thank you, Hallie. And no, we're not going to be needing uh, those sorts of alerts anytime soon because we would just be having uh, some heat alerts coming across your phone, but I don't believe the National Weather Service will be pushing any of those. It's a good move by the National Weather Service, though, because not all severe thunderstorms are created equal. Certainly some are more potent and potentially destructive than others. But yeah, we're just talking about heat for the next little while. Uh, tomorrow, we've just got some very few showers in play, a lot fewer than what the Brazos Valley saw today. By the weekend, we'll be talking mid 90s to upper 90s. And by the way, from Saturday through the next nine to 10 days, those rain chances are zero. So tomorrow's going to be the last chance we have to get some rain for a little while. And those afternoon heat indices, well, those are going to be uh, above 100 degrees each and every afternoon for about the next week or so. Tonight, our lows will be fairly mild, dropping down to 76 degrees, 72 in Franklin and Rockdale, 76 in Somerville, and also uh, looks like Caldwell at 70. Four degrees. So tomorrow, those temperatures are continuing to climb a little bit. Now talking about 93, also 93 in Navasota, Franklin 93, and Cameron at 93 degrees as well. Of course, when you tack on the humidity, it's going to feel closer to 100 degrees, maybe 101 during peak heating of the afternoon. So tonight, those showers will calm down. We're looking at clearing skies. Tomorrow, can't roll out a shower or two somewhere in the Brazos Valley. A future track is probably being a little bit too optimistic about those shower chances. I don't think we're going to see very many at all. Saturday, this is really when things begin to dry out, though. High pressure moves in and those showers are completely gone. A lot of the cloud cover will be gone, too, and temperatures really do begin to warm up. So going through tomorrow, we're going to be 87 degrees by noon. 93 will be your high at 4 o'clock and then 82 degrees at 10 p.m. with partly cloudy conditions. And here is that very toasty 10 day forecast. We've got some 96s and 97s out there. Basically not much fluctuation through the next week. Very little rain, if any, and it's going to be hot and humid.
With the increased heat coming, can the Texas power grid handle the increase electric usage? According to the Public Utility Commission, which oversees ERCOT, the answer is yes. The chairman of the commission says both groups are working through the summer with a, quote, abundance of caution. The interim ERCOT president said the council is reversing its policy and putting reliability ahead of price. Things are starting to look up when it comes to car sales. Prices on both used and new cars have gone up dramatically, partly because of a chip shortage. And now one company says that relief is coming. Taiwan Semiconductor makes up a large part of the chip production market. It says production for the units that go in cars will go up 60% this year compared to last year. Experts say it is hard to tell exactly when we will start seeing that affects car prices and supply. One of the many factors other than the trip chip shortage is that your know, rental fleets are down. So they're looking to uh, to boost their fleets back up again. And we have to consider that used cars are lasting longer. They're staying on the road longer and in people's possession longer. The good news is prices have already started improving. Price increases are slowing down and the shortage of cars is less severe. Experts at Carfax say it looks like that trend will continue, but if you need a car now, you probably won't see a dramatic price drop. There really isn't uh, you know, a best time or a bad time to buy. If you need a car, you wanna make sure you're getting uh, a good deal and paying the right price for it. And that's really, especially on a used car, that's really where your research comes in and making sure you're getting the most accurate price for a vehicle. One car maker that continues to have problems with the chip shortage is Daimler. That owns Mercedes-Benz and smart cars. It started prioritizing its production of its more expensive models, but now it says it can't even keep up with making those cars and they had to briefly stop production yesterday. BMW has also had to cut down on production. Ford says it may start shipping cars without chips to dealerships and they can't be sold. And then dealers would need to install the chips whenever they become available. Still ahead in our lineup, the recent change that lets college athletes get paid for endorsements is opening up an entire new world. How NCAA players are now cashing in. in the Extreme heat and dry conditions continue to fuel wildfires across the West. Officials say this is a fire season that is unlike anything they have seen before. More than 70 large fires are burning across 13 states. The largest is the bootleg fire in Southern Oregon that has now burned more than 394,000 acres. But there is some initial evidence that some of the forest treatment work that groups have been doing in that area may be working to make this fire less intense and it could offer some lessons about how to make sure that forests are resilient in the future when it comes to climate change. That work really looks like a combination of careful and thoughtful thinning of the smaller trees in those in those forests, um, opening it back up, leaving the largest, most fire tolerant trees, uh, and then critically reintroducing uh, fire through prescribed fire or controlled burning. Um, so that we're essentially mimicking that, that historical, cultural, and natural role of fire in these systems. The Nature Conservancy has been doing the work that he just described for more than a decade in the Saikan Marsh Preserve, where the bootleg fire has spread. Now, he says this fire is intense because of the ongoing drought in that area, but they are hearing some promising news from firefighters. This fire burned um, across untreated areas and then into the work, the work that we and our partners on the Forest Service and the work in partnership with the climate tribes have been doing is that that fire actually reduced in severity. It went from a crown fire burning through the canopies of the trees and returned to something more like that surface fire, the ground fire. Now he says that ground fires are less severe and they're actually safer for firefighters. The Nature Conservancy is doing similar fire restoration efforts across the West. They plan to get better data on the bootleg fire when it's safe. Now the federal government is giving communities more money from this year's COVID-19 relief bill. The U.S. Secretary of Commerce announced today $3 billion in economic development grants will be available. These grants are targeted at job training programs, developing new industries, and supporting local infrastructure. Recipients will be picked based on the anticipated return on investment to taxpayers. Now, the number of starter homes on the market is at a 50-year low. This is according to loan company Freddie Mac. They define starter homes as a single family space up to 1,400 square feet. In the late 1970s, an average of 418,000 of these homes were built each year. In 2020, that number 
was 65,000. Now, data from the National Association of Home Builders shows part of it may be that single family homes are getting significantly bigger. Many are no longer considered an affordable entry level house. It has been a few weeks since the NCAA policy change, letting athletes earn money in endorsement deals from their name, image, and likeness without the fear of facing repercussion. Since then, hundreds in every sport have already signed deals. Uh, University of Alabama quarterback has already racked up almost a million dollars in endorsements. Michelle London caught up with two Fresno State basketball players who say this has been a game changer for their financial future. Twin sisters Hannah and Haley Cavender together only stand five foot six inches tall. But on the court, in their Fresno State basketball jerseys, the two point guards hold a giant presence. It's just been something that Hannah and I always dreamed of. Uh, we love, we both share the love of basketball so much, so it was something that was just such a goal to play in college basketball together. As the two prepare to suit up for their junior season, that same presence is becoming more massive off the court. Speaking of TikTok, how many followers now? I think 3.4. 3 yeah, 4. 3.4. It's crazy. <laughs> How? I, I don't, don't know. know. We don't we, know. We, we I really... think it's because people like that we're twins. Yeah. What was the video that kind of exploded your followers that probably went viral, you would say? The first video that like went viral was our chicken wing one. Viral posts like this one on TikTok with synchronized dribbling to a hot beat. The twins say all started from boredom during quarantine. And took a domino effect on June 30th. As the NCAA granted college athletes across the country permission to benefit or earn money using their name and image. Just hours after the new rule took effect, Haley and Hannah's lives as student athletes changed for the better. On July 1st at 12 a.m., we actually got a Boost Mobile contract. The Cavender twins signed a six-month branding deal with a phone carrier and posted ads on Instagram for various companies, including Six Star Nutrition and GoPuff. They give credit to Icon Source, a marketing company that helps professional and now college athletes score endorsement deals. 460,000 student athletes that now have the ability to work with brands and then now brands in communities that never imagined working with athletes now have a potential to, to work with a local volleyball player or soccer player. Icon Source CEO Chase Garrett says the key to successful branding for young athletes starts with good framework. Having a great representation, good kind of family structure and understanding how to position themselves for the long term. Is this a healthy move for athletes? So I think done in the right way, it is. Garrett says since the image and likeness rule change, he's seen so many brands excited to jump on board with clients in non-revenue sports other than men's football and basketball, like the Cavender twins. Hannah and Haley say basketball remains a top priority with a goal to make it to the March Madness tournaments this season. As for managing their brands, their message to incoming freshman student athletes is simple. Prioritizing the right things. Don't just be so focused on building your brand. I'm Michelle London reporting. Michelle, thank you. And finally in our lineup, scammers are using all avenues of contact to seem to be more convincing. How they're now combining emails, phone calls and text messages to get a hold of your personal information. Attempts to steal personal or company information through emails, phone calls, and text messages are nothing new, but attackers are getting more sophisticated in combining these methods to make them seem more legit. Think about the scenario of a two-factor message attempt sent to your mobile phone. Then you, then you receive a phishing call or a vishing call on your phone, and then they ask you, we just sent you a, a code. Can you please let us know what that is so that we can move forward with this conversation? Mark Ostrowski with Checkpoint Security says you want to be aware for these multi-factor scam scenarios. Checkpoint documented an increase specifically in what are called vishing attempts late last year. The FBI warned of it again this year, especially with remote work. And as for who criminals are targeting, there are high value victims, but it's typically based on the information available. The organizations and the scammers who are trying to pull this off will actually go through your social media profiles and find information create fake social media accounts to make, the, make you feel like that maybe 
a, perhaps you're a recruiter or someone who works for a company that's associated with you to make it more likely, um, as well as a lot of these organizations actually will post information for help on the dark web and use the dark web as a way to actually recruit people to actually do these campaigns, perhaps in the same language as where the attack is gonna take place. So it is really about how much information that you have publicly on social media accounts, as well as the information that is available through past security breaches and being sold on the dark web. And that's why changing your password is so important. Now, as far as cell phone companies, they do offer spam control features, but those aren't 100%, and you could still end up seeing fake caller IDs that say things like IRS or social security. Because what ends up happening is that the, the attackers or these organizations who are looking to gain this information are able to leverage you know, voice over IP networks where phone numbers are constantly changing and they can avoid that list to be able to still get calls to come through. If you do fall for any sort of scam and if you're working from home, it is best to contact your IT help desk so they can change company credentials. And if it's a personal multi-factor authentication scam, it is best to use that one-time code as soon as possible to log into the account that it's associated with and freeze it. Also, contact the institution or bank it's associated with and let them know what happened. I'm Chris Conti here in New Orleans, home of Mardi Gras Creole and this year's Scripps Spelling Bee National Champion. What do you hope uh, like other kids maybe take away from this whole thing? Uh, that they can do it and that it's like possible to be done and that they prob probably need to study a lot uh, to win. Coming up tomorrow, we go one on one with her on the court and talk about her plans for the future and what life has been like since winning the national title. I'm Chris Conti here in New Orleans, home of Mardi Gras.